Greetings comrades, my name is Gigantos and as promised, this is the second half of my series concerning how Christ suffered during the Passion. So last video we covered how Christ suffered during 5pm on Holy Thursday up to 11am on the Good Friday. And we find that he suffered immensely before he was even crucified, whether it was physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain. And if you haven't watched that video yet, I'd recommend you watch it now. Because this video carries on from this, and it's a lot worse. Christ, how Christ suffered during the crucifixion is a lot worse. I can genuinely feel the pain building up inside of me as I say this, because I know exactly what I'm going to end up saying. Because I read the script, obviously, but because it's incredibly painful just to even think about it, let alone talk about it. So, as I said last episode, he had to watch this crowd mocking him and laughing at him and jeering at him and throwing insults. It's St. John and his disciples and... His mother watched helplessly, unable to do anything to comfort him. And Jesus had to watch them, knowing that they were suffering, unable to help him. And that he, again, he, could, he, could, he could get away, he could, he could summon the angels and get out of there. But he knew that this is how it had to be, and he had to accept what was going to happen to him. So poor Mary was going to see the fifth sort of sorrow, and he was going to rip her heart in two, along with Jesus's. So between 11 and 12 p.m., Jesus was crucified. He had been left bloody and naked after his garments were removed so everyone could see all the blood and sweat and dust and sand and dirt stuck to his skin through blood and sweat even in his wounds causing further pain just even moving maybe the blood covered the massive bruises under his skin from his severe beating because according to saint bridget of sweden jesus suffered 5480 blows to his body 5,480 blows, snaps, punches, hits, kicks, blows, 5,480, yet he still somehow carried a 136 kilogram cross to Calvary, as his body was a giant bruise, a single bruise across, across his entire form, bleeding from countless wounds across his back and legs and arms and shoulder from the scourging and the, and the friction of the cross on him. And keeping in mind the state of his back, Jesus was then forced to lie down on top of the cross, which the splintered wood, not only embedding itself deeply into his shoulder, would now embed itself into the rest of his back. The crown was digging into the back of his skull now. The soldiers sat on him to hold him down, pressing the wood deep into his wounds as he held the nails over his palms and his ankles. With blow after blow, they hammered nails, several inches thick, through the base of his palm and through the arch of his feet, straight into the wood. And with Jesus' body in agony, as he probably screamed when they hammered the nails through his body, they then lifted the cross. And Jesus then started feeling his, the weight of his body pull on his wounds, opening them wider and causing him further agony, until the cross slipped into the hole that it was meant to sit into. And as it did so, the cross jerked forward, which Jesus' body weight then caused him to be thrown forwards, which then not only caused great injury to his hands and feet, but it probably dislocated his at least one shoulder of his, before he slammed back into the cross, where splinters dug into his back anew, and the crown of thorns was pressed deeper into his skull. If he didn't scream throughout all this, I wouldn't think he, yeah, that he was able to even feel pain. Jesus' body weight rested on his hands and feet. The position of the nails in his hands meant that they triggered both parts of the median nerves in his hands. Which would mean every time he moved his hand, it would cause agony. Yet even despite all this, Christ still asked for God to forgive those that were doing this to him. Now. No parent wants to see their child suffer. So maybe even St. Joseph, in the limbo of the fathers, if he was watching this, seeing the foster child that he'd helped raise, suffering so painfully, or that Mary, who couldn't do more to comfort him other than hold his feet and just be with him throughout his passion and suffering the cross. Imagine the anguish of knowing that you had, you had help. You could just get off that cross so easily. But you mustn't. 
Now this next part of the video deals specifically with Jesus' suffering on the cross and what it did to his body. To describe it this the best way I can, the crucifixion is the reason why we have the word excruciating, because nothing could compare to what Jesus went through on that cross. You see, as Jesus hung, his legs wouldn't have been straightened fully. They would at most be bent at a 45 degree angle, if not less. This would mean that he would have to bear the, his entire weight with his thigh muscles, as he pressed down on the nails in his own feet to hold him up. But this would cause severe cramps in his thigh and calves after just a few minutes. As his legs tired, he would have to hold himself up with his arms. However, with the angle of his arms and his weight, his arms would have dislocated themselves after a few minutes, and then his elbows would, and then his wrists. If not in that order, then they would still dislocate all of them. Which is why Jesus' arms in the Shroud Turin look so long. It's because over time they dislocated from all their joints. Which meant Jesus now hung from his dislocated arms, unable to feel them, except just burning fire. So Jesus had to rely on his burning leg muscles because of his burning, unfeeling arms to hold himself up on the cross. All this while people were still mocking and shouting at him from below. And he was like that for almost an hour. Until then he comforted St. Dismas, the good thief. Because at this point in time he would be able to still talk properly. And shortly after this was around when he probably asked St. John to look after Mary, his mother. Because again, this was when he could still talk. After this, things started getting worse. Because the angle Jesus was on the cross... And because his arms were limp and stretching, it pulled on his pectoris muscles, which are basically the breasts, which then caused his ribcage to be pulled upward and outward. This meant that his chest was enlarged, and so he was unable to exhale properly, so he was struggling to breathe. In order to breathe, he had to push down on the nails in his body so that his mu muscle could relax, so that he could breathe out and continue to respire. Otherwise, Jesus hung there doing nothing. He wouldn't have been able to breathe because his resting position meant that his lungs were fully expanded. If his legs were at a 45 degree angle, he would have had to lift himself up 12 inches to be able to breathe. He would have to lift himself up a whole foot into the air to breathe, using nothing but impaled feet, cramped legs, and unfeeling burning arms. As his back scraped up and down, against the splintered cross, sticking pieces of wood and dirt into his wounds, making them bleed further. Not only was he in physical agony, but there was also the fact that if he didn't move enough, he would have struggled to be breathed, and the fear of not being able to breathe forced him to keep going in this pain. Which meant that as his median nerves screamed from the movement, he was in constant pain as he started tiring. In the hot sun, he hadn't had a single drink. He was thirsty and tired, and had blood on his face, and he couldn't wipe himself as he hung there naked. And he saw his mother in her fifth sort of sorrow, with St. John and St. Mary Magdalene, and a few of his other disciples down there watching helplessly. But he couldn't comfort them, nor did any of his other disciples or apostles go there to be there for him, just to give him support, or even watch from a distance. And as time went by, he started tiring from the effort to breathe, and his legs were becoming more and more painful. The increasing dislocation made it harder to breathe because his chest was raised even higher. This movement caused him further pain from the nails and in his back. However, he still had to keep pushing himself so that he could breathe. Because otherwise, if he started that from fatigue, he would struggle to breathe, which meant that he had to push himself further even amidst all the pain. And the cramps worsened. Yet the people still mocking him as Jesus' disciples watched helplessly, Mary unable to even just support him, to hold him up, and maybe even just spare him a single breath. It was around here when Jesus could still somehow breathe, that Jesus, he asked why he had been forsaken. Things continued getting worse for him. Due to a lack of adequate ventilation in his lungs, he entered a state of hyperventilation. He also experienced hypoxia due to his blood oxygen levels falling, and also developed hypercapnia, which is because of his blood carbon dioxide levels increasing. This stimulated his heart to beat faster to speed up the gaseous exchange in his lungs. His breathing accelerated, 
and he began to pant, which caused further pain and had to do this instead of a couple of times a minute, he had to do this several times a minute, just so he could get adequate breath. This caused further jeering from the crowd. The hypoxia and the hypercapnia led to tachycardia, which is an increase in the heart rate, possibly up to 220 beats a minute, which is the maximum that can be sustained by the human body normally. Due to amounts of fluids lost from his body through blood and sweat, his blood pressure dropped, possibly 80 over 50, and he went to the stage of hypertension. He hadn't drunk anything since the last supper, and his heart was beginning to fail. Then, at around 2, Jesus knew he was getting close to death very quickly. He had developed hypovolemia, which was a low blood volume due to all the blood he'd lost. He also had tachycardia, tachypnea, which is accelerated breathing, hyperhidrosis, which is this excess of sweating, and he was in first degree shock. His lungs were filling up with pulmonary edema, which made breathing harder due to their reduced capacity. In addition to his heart failure, he was also experiencing respiratory failure. He cried out, I thirst, because if this were a modern medical emergency, at this point in time, the human body would need an immediate blood and plasma transfusion to survive. Jesus was struggling to breathe now, worse than before. He turned down the medicated sponge filled with alcohol and vinegar because he had promised not to drink anything, and he had to accept all this pain fully for what it was. He then began to develop hemopericardium, which is a buildup of fluid around the heart. This then caused him to develop cardiac tamponade, which the pressure of the fluid on his heart caused his heart to beat less efficiently. And on 3 p.m., around the third hour on the cross, Jesus knew death was minutes away, and he was struggling to talk because he had shortness of breath. Every fibre of his being was burning like fire, even if he couldn't move that part of the body, made worse by the fact that his body trying to survive was only causing him further pain. And now, the worst pain of them all came, something that I call the divine agony, which only God would be able to experience. You see, Jesus as God knew that here, in this way, he was being humiliated, and that he didn't deserve to suffer like this. Yet he knew that he had to suffer like this for our sakes. He knew that he could get down. He could call his angels down to help him, and they'll, and they'll tend to him. But he mustn't. He had to continue on with this. And the fact that he knew he could just get away from this, he's just even thinking it. But he, he, had, he had to hold back, he had to not use that power. It caused him an incredible pain. As he entered the final few minutes of his life, it was as though it were a sequence of images, like your life flashing before your eyes. Jesus experienced something only someone divine could experience. Using his omniscience, he looked into everyone's lives, past, present, and future. He looked into absolutely everyone's, yours and mine as well. Everyone watches this video, everyone who just scrolls over this, everyone who is even unaware of what he did for them, or even the, they don't even know who Jesus is. He looked into everyone's lives. He saw their hearts and what his sacrifice would do for them, would do for us. He saw those who would accept his sacrifice and would be saved, and then those who would reject it and wouldn't be saved. He saw every soul in the universe, and quite possibly if it did exist, every soul in the multiverse, or the omniverse, however big you can go, he saw every soul to every soul in existence. He felt his hemopericardium developing rapidly because of the emotional strain this was putting on his heart. His divine sadness and agony was becoming so much for him that his body couldn't handle it. It was damaging his human heart. And so he muttered, with possibly one of the last gasps he could manage, it is done. Because he was seconds away from the end. He raised his eyes from his suffering and looked down at those before him, at those laughing and jeering at him, at those mocking at him and watching him suffer. He looked as he saw his disciples, he saw St. Mary Magdalene, he saw St. John with an arm around Mary, he saw Mary holding his feet looking up at him with her eyes streaming, tears and, blood, and the blood from his body dripping on her face. He saw that they said he had looked into the child as a baby, all the faces around him that he had formed in the womb. And with their faces still in his vision, 
It makes so much acknowledgement of all these followers who were there to be with him to the very end, with all the faces of all the souls in his mind. With one final effort, he pushed himself up on the cross, on his torn feet, his back scraping against the cross, brutally, causing more blood to drip down, his median nerves in his hands screaming in pain as he shook from side to side on his dislocated arms, the thorns digging into his skull as they scraped against the back of the cross, his massively cramped legs burning like they'd been dipped in lava. And looking up to heaven, he surrendered his spirits to God. And with that, he experienced a myocardial rupture, which was his heart literally bursting from the pressure, and he killed him instantly, and he fell limp. Then came the earthquake, and the veil of the temple was tearing, and then the centurion saying truly this was the son of God. And then there were those who had initially hated Jesus and called for his death, staring in silent horror at what had happened around them, and all his, and all Jesus' followers looking horrified themselves at, and sad at the loss of their leader and their teacher, and Mary pouring her eyes out from losing her son. And then the Romans came along to break the legs of the thieves. And Jesus, after three excruciating hours on the cross, was already dead. And then a few hours left at the beginning of the Sabbath, when Mary could compose herself enough to watch Jesus. She broke anew into tears every time she saw a wound on his body, showing further just how much he had truly suffered. All the splinters in his flesh, all the sand and grit in his wounds, all the torn skin and missing and exposed flesh and bone, all the thorns and clothes sticky with blood, all that his body had endured for our sakes. Even though she couldn't see it directly, knowing that somewhere in his chest, where she'd seen the spear go in his side and blood and water drip out, was a heart so full of love for us that not only did it move to come down to earth for our sakes and to teach us, but to also suffer for us and burst out of sheer love for us. Now, many Christians have been martyred and tortured through crucifixion. Many of them have suffered an incredible amount of agony. But not one of them, not one of them, suffered quite like Jesus ever did. Because even if you carried out the agony of Jesus exactly as the Bible and the mystics and all the evidence suggests he suffered, we will never match the divine sadness and the divine agony that he experienced on that cross, knowing that there were souls out there he couldn't save, knowing that there were people who would reject all that he did for them, and that he could do no more for them, knowing that the souls that he had fallen in the womb would be lost forever, knowing that he could go down and save everyone without needing to suffer, but having to as part of the sacrifice, and knowing that that was how he would suffer, but he still pushed on up to the very end as the bravest man who had ever lived. But yes, Jesus did was resurrected and he defeated death and opened the gates to heaven. He did. And we should always remember that after death comes the resurrection, after defeat comes victory, after the night comes the day. But never ever forget what Jesus went through for us. Because there are people out there who will say that they've sinned terribly and that there's no way Jesus would ever forget them. There's no way that he could accept them into his church, that their sins are too great. But believe me, when Jesus was on that cross, in those final minutes of his life, looking through everyone's lives and looking at yours, looking at your heart, watching you closely to see whether you will accept his sacrifice or not, he is willing to forgive you if you forgive yourself and go, and go to his church. If you are willing to become part of his family, there is nothing he won't forgive. So it doesn't matter how great your sin is or what you've done. If you have a repentant heart, enough that it turned your heart toward Jesus, then your suffering on the cross was worth it, if it can bring you to salvation. Never, under any circumstances, forget how much Jesus loves you. Because nobody 
I never love you as much as God does. And no one would be able to bear what Jesus did for us. Because no one could love us as much as Jesus did. Never forget that. In the brightest of days, in the darkest of hours, never forget how much Jesus loves you. And how much he gave up for you. And how much he wants you to be with him. And he sacrificed himself for you. His heart burst with love for you. And he came back from the dead to prove that not even death would be able to hold you away from him. So never forget how much God loves you all. And that is Christ's passion in two painful videos. Hopefully you controlled yourself better than I did during that. Or when I did my research. And apologies for if this puts a downer somewhat on your day. But never forget how he suffered for you. And never let that hold you back from doing anything for the church. Because nothing will if you have a truly repentant heart. Have a good Easter, all of you. God bless you all. And hopefully the next video will be a bit more positive. So see you next video, comrades. Until then.